Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering the topic of the dual track process and really understanding and defining what the term actually means, what the strategy means, talking about an example, a real world example, and then talking about the key considerations that are involved when deciding whether to really engage and commit to the dual track process. So what is the dual track process? When a firm is evaluating its strategic options, the dual track process offers ownership a favorable way to maximize the business's value. Through this strategy, the company engages in both the IPO and auction process and only decides in a much later stage which option offers the best alternative and therefore is completed. So there can be even a third option, a third refinancing track. So it's not a dual track, but it can also be a triple track process. And so in the third track, the company can also test the bond market so they can raise, you know, high yield debt. So they engage in the IPO process, the au auction process and the raising of debt and that and that process as well. So what that does is it essentially tests the market in all three of those options all at the same time and only at the end of that stage do they determine based on this demand and based on the value of our company, I think this is the best option. And so that provides a lot of leverage and we'll talk about those benefits. So why is this process useful? The dual track process is common among private equity exits, where a financial sponsor analyzes the market and decides that the financial and labor expense of this process is worthwhile to test both options. In a volatile market with a company that faces buyer uncertainty, especially if it's in a in a new segment, an excellent an, an excellent example is the uh, the marijuana companies, these private companies, where maybe there's one or two companies that are publicly listed now, but when when they were first coming onto the market and there was no comparable example and, and they were the first company to come on the market, how do you really decide? Is is there enough demand for me? Well, I don't want to engage the IPO process and then back out at the end of the day. I want to put myself in a position where if I engage in the IPO process, I have an alternative. I can sell the company. And so that's why you would engage in the dual track process. So pursuing both options enables management to see where the best value can be realized and thus maximizes shareholder returns and provides the best option, of course. So the M&A side of the dual track process is a full-blown auction rather than a targeted auction as the focus is to generate the highest bid and therefore maximize the value of the company. Now there is a huge challenge in managing both tracks for management and their team of advisors. For smaller companies who are leanly staffed, distracting management with this process, which means doing the due diligence, sitting down with investment bankers and advisors for long periods of time to really walk them through the the different financial statements and processes that can be impact the business negatively while the inter interaction among advisors can oftentimes be confusing as well so it can really confuse their incentives and we'll talk about management incentives and how they can differ when presented with the options of an IPO and an M&A sale so what is a real world example well in 2014 Pacific Equity Partners pushed to sell one of their portfolio holdings, Peter's Ice Cream, by the end of the quarter. So they wanted to sell this company very quickly in, 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 in the month of three, in the span of three months. And in 2014, the public markets, especially in North America, were quite volatile. So on such a short timeline, the dual track process helped the firm gain a quick understanding of the market. So they needed to sell in this position, regardless of that issue. We won't talk about the issue, but we'll talk about they wanted to sell, so they had to sell. But they didn't know what the best option was. The markets were volatile, and they didn't know if it was best to pursue an IPO. right? So what they did is in the end, they engaged in that dual track process, and it seemed that the third party sale to Nestle was the best amount. And so the amount was undisclosed, but they chose to pursue that option. And it meant that in this case, it was good that they engaged in that because most private equity companies, they go down that IPO track, especially if they want to hold equity in the company for a longer period of time. If they want to flip the company, they can then sell it later on. But this was a, a good example of, especially in 2014, a company that really used the dual track process smartly. So let's understand the strategy. 
What are some potential benefits? Well, number one, it maximizes exit proceeds by taking a look at both alternatives and determining which uh, which option should we pursue to really maximize the value of the business? It can also increase the transaction certainty and speed if done correctly. So when you're talking about transaction certainty, that means that, say, for example, you're engaging in that auction process. Well, companies know that the backup plan is the IPO. So we need a bit fast. We're not going to drag our heels and, you know, kind of like negotiate really slowly. We got to complete this deal fast because this company can pursue the IPO right away. They can go up and until the very end of it. So it's also a hedge for uncertain markets by delaying the decision until very late in the process. And so that, that's the perfect example with the Pacific Equity Partners example. So it was a hedge to really see, do we engage and we pursue the IPO or do we sell the company? And you can really make that decision all the way to the end where you've already collected enough information to determine demand from both a sale perspective and just an IPO perspective. And at the same time, you have the ability to engage in a triple track, which ensures leverage. Whether you are going with a dual track or the triple track, this provides a lot of leverage because as always, when you are negotiating with bidders, you can tell them, well, guys, you got to tell me right now, if you seriously want to buy this company, bid higher, because if not, I'm walking to the public markets and I'm going to IPO the company. And so that provides a lot of leverage, but we'll talk about way th th how that differs. So what are some challenges? The first one and the most obvious one is the cost. And hiring lawyers and investment bankers is very high. And for small companies, it might not be worth it. At the same time, if there's no buying demand, running an IPO prevents a full exit. And so for a private equity company that wants to exit that company in order to take that equity and pay it back to lim their limited partners, it's 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 there's a downside risk to that. But as always, I think of it as alternatives. Well, if the if the, the private equity sponsor wanted to get a, get out of the company and they had no buying demand from an M and A perspective, then at the end of the day, they still would have had to IPO it. So it's not really such a big challenge. At the same time, the process is longer than a pure auction. So if you were to engage in just a simple auction process, the time it would take to complete the diligence and engage with those bidders is shorter than what it would take to not only co complete due diligence from an IPO perspective, but also gauge that interest and file the, the, the preliminary prospectus. There's also the time commitment, which is required by management, and it can impact the business negatively by distracting those managers from daily operations to go into these meetings with all these advisors. So there are some challenges. It's not without, uh, not without challenge. Now, there are four key considerations when considering the dual track process. There's a timeline, the ad advisors, the leverage and negotiation, and management incentives. So number one, timeline. On the IPO path, it generally takes between 60 to 90 days after the initial submission to clear SEC comments. And so you file the preliminary prospectus to the SEC to really show them that, okay, you know, we're interested in, you know, listing this public company, and they're going to come back to you with different requirements. Oh, you need to change that, change that. And so that can take between 60 and 90 days. And there is an initial 30-day review period followed by initial uh, additional filings approximately every two to three weeks until all SEC comments are resolved. On the M&A side, there is a number of due diligence steps and other meetings and presentations between management and other key, key personnel of the target company and bidders. If the auction sale is run as a two-stage process, a round of initial bids will narrow the scope of the field and be followed by final bids. So from the IPO path, the timeline for that one track is between 60 and 90 days. Whereas with the M&A side, you have to complete due diligence, which involves the investment banks valuing the company, sitting down with management and understanding the business, and then engaging in the auction process, which first you circle kind of like a preliminary kind of uh, um, uh, piece of information to gauge their interest. And once the bidders submit a kind of valuation range of what they would be willing to pay, you then head into the second stage where you open up your data room and then allow them to really learn about your company and then submit real bids. So the M&A side can take a little longer, but if done correctly and done in an efficient manner, the uh, both paths can run kind of in sequence all the way to the end where you can finally make that decision. But as you can see, it can it's very, very complex. And if there are any issues when it comes to due diligence, then right away, the, the, your plans can be derailed. And that's why it can be qu quite costly.
Now, it is unusual to run all the way to the end of the IPO process and then sell. So usually a company will make a decision on whether to sell prior to launching the roadshow. So with an IPO, you make those uh, the submission to SEC, and once you receive that approval, you usually file a red herring, that preliminary prospectus, which is circulated, and then go on the roadshow. So usually for the for the IPO track and the dual track process, it goes all the way up to when you should be going on the roadshow, and then you wait, and then you hopefully in sequence your your M and A process is also going well, and you're going through the rounds, and then at that point. Uh, you should be in your second rounds uh, of, of negotiation. And finally, when the bidders are really submitting their final bids, you can tell them, well, guys, I'm about to go on my roadshow, so you better make sure that if you really want this company, you bid aggressively. So at the final stage of the dual track process, assuming both paths have been followed to their ultimate conclusion, the target company will be able to compare the relative valuations offered by an IPO versus an M&A exit. And not only the valuation, but also the options. So once again, if you're a private equity company, do you want to completely exit out of that investment? Or do you want to hold a little more, assuming that you believe the company is going to increase in value once it's publicly listed? Right, So there are a lot of considerations, and that's really the core benefit of the dual track process. Now, the biggest consideration is the advisors. Managing the team of advisors is arguably the biggest challenge in the process. Most companies choose a lead underwriter who can also serve as the M&A advisor. Now, this helps in really completing the due diligence faster because that bank would kind of share that information. Even though they would not explicitly share all information, they could work off each other in a way that would speed up that due, the due diligence process. Now, there is generally only one M&A advisor, and it is valuable to have the advisor basically neutral on the two outcomes, knowing that they'll get a substantial fee as either the lead underwriter for the IPO or as the sole M&A advisor if the auction is completed. And this helps ensure that they devote full effort to both processes. And so there's a lot of incentives when it even comes to advisors. So usually the lead underwriter and the lead the the M and A advisor is the same investment bank. Now, commonly there are two underwriters or more for the syndicate of banks that complete the IPO and help distribute the company shares if the IPO is pursued. However, unlike the IPO, a sale process may not require the involvement of multiple banks. As a result, while an IPO contemplates allocation of the underwriting discount among a syndicate of banks, the fees paid in connection with an M&A transaction often contemplate a small, smaller number of recipients and possibly only one bank. So in a scenario where we'll really simplify it, we have one M&A advisor and we have a lead underwriter and then we have two other supporting underwriters. So the syndicate is three banks, which distribute that issue. And both tracks would pay out $150 million in fees. Well, the M&A track, all that $150 million would go directly to the lead underwriter at the same time, the M&A advisor. Whereas if the IPO was pursued, the lead underwriter would receive a smaller amount because now it would have to be shared among the syndicate of banks, the three banks rather than one. So there's a lot of incentives when it comes to the fees paid. And that's why you really need to structure your team of advisors in a way in which you really spread it out so that they're equally incentivized so that they're neutral on the both paths and that's very very important now another key consideration is leverage with the threat of the company walk, walking away from an offer the dual track process can help a seller during sell side negotiations while less effective with many bidders if there are only one or two interested parties having this second alternative can increase the valuation of the business there is clear leverage when there is limited acquisition demand. That should be your takeaway. So when there's a lot of bidders, you know, inserting your threat of walking away will not have such a large marginal effect. But say, for example, there's one or two companies, especially when there's only one company. Well, then you're going to tell them, no, I'm firm on my selling price. If not, I can go to the market and get that price. So either you're going to match it or beat it or I'm gonna walk. So when there's less demand from an acquisition perspective, there's much more leverage for you in the dual track process. A study on the benefits of the dual track IPO processes found that the sale of a company engaged in a dual track IPO resulted in a 22 
to 26% premium, a higher premium than the sale of your privately held company not engaged in a concurrent IPO process. So what that means is you can extract a lot of value and that leverage results in a 22 to 26% premium. Now I'm going to question those numbers because again, you can't really see all of the data, but studies do prove that there is a clear statistically significant benefit to shareholders when engaging in the dual track process due to this leverage in negotiation. Now, one of the challenges in dual track process is balancing the incentives of management with the fiduciary duty of the board to maximize shareholder value. Usually, management and especially company founders favor the IPO to a sale because of the relative job certainty and increased reputation. Think about it. If you are the CEO of a company and you are presented with the options of choosing between an IPO and an M&A sale and you question your the continued uh, it, your job post M&A, you're probably going to be fired or you're kind of going to be demoted within the larger organization. So really your status within your company is going to decline. Whereas with an IPO, you now become the head of a publicly traded company and you're still in that same position and probably going to make even more money as your stock becomes more valuable. So there's an incentive to lean towards the IPO. So there's a this balance is very, very difficult because for the board of directors, they need to focus on maximizing value, not what you want as the management, as the CEO of the company, whereas you, who is going to be leading the company, wants more money, you want that IPO process. And if you don't get it, you know, you th that, that conflict can arise. And so it is a big issue to consider when engaging in the dual track process. So it is important that the board of directors considers management's incentives to complete either an acquisition or an IPO. And so there's no easy solution, but a, a way to really approach it is the board should tally up the compensation that management is likely to receive in either scenario, including the case of termination following an acquisition, and make the necessary adjustments to incentivize management to implement whatever decision is taken by the board. So probably the, the easiest change or and hypothetically, the easiest change is to increase the golden parachute for that respective uh, management team. So in a scenario where the M&A uh, sale does occur and they get fired, well, their compensation is going to increase because of their golden parachute increasing, right? And that will balance out incentives. Now, there are some th five things to remember th that can really derail the dual track process if forgotten. Number one is understanding the risks. Right from the beginning, sitting down with the management team and all key personnel and walking them through what the risks are, not only the benefits of the dual track process. At the same time, they really need to commit. Commit from the start to the process of sitting down with advisors, walking them through the business and doing that due diligence process. It can take a lot of time and they need to understand that up front, they need to make that commitment right from the beginning. At the same time, you need to keep management motivated and focused. So in a scenario where they do see that it's heading towards the M&A sale rather than the IPO and their jobs are going to be lost and they become all depressed and stuff, you really need to make sure that you're displaying their incentives clearly. So once again, returning to that management incentive, increasing the uh, golden parachute or increasing the incentives in a scenario where the M&A uh, route is pursued. At the same time, you, you need to appear committed to both alternatives. Now, for leverage to really work, when you walk away from that table, you really make, need to make sure that, yes, if I'm walking away from negotiations in the, in, in, in the uh, auction process and I'm going towards the IPO process, I need to make sure that I'm actually willing to IPO my company. Because if the bidder realizes that, now nah, you're not going to do, you're not going to complete an IPO, then they're, they're not really going to budge on what they want to pay for the business. So it's really important that you appear committed. To both alternatives and finally focusing on shareholders and I would also note focusing on the company don't forget about the company through this entire process you should be focusing on the shareholders and what their desires are so for the management team understanding what the owners want do they want to maximize value or do they want to monetize their stake so that they hold still some equity in the public company through an IPO or do they actually just want to exit out and take the cash and, and, and run right so it's really important to understand what the shareholder needs are and at the same time communicate those shareholder needs to management so they're not surprised when they're like hey they're so greedy why do they want to sell so that I lose my job right they need to understand from the very beginning what the shareholders want and why they are pursuing this dual track process 
So in conclusion, the dual track process has become a common exit strategy for private equity firms looking to maximize their total return. There are many advantages to the process, but not without challenges, and we've talked about those. For management, it is important to understand your objectives from the very start and commit to the exhaustive process of due diligence in order to successfully leverage the advisor's negotiating position. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you found it very helpful. If you have any questions, please do comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And as always, if you did like the video, please like and subscribe to the channel for more videos. I will be posting as many videos as I can in the coming uh, months. So please do like and subscribe. Thank you so much and have a great day.